Hello and welcome to Speak Out on Strangles, the Strangles Awareness Week podcast, which aims to give horse owners a real insight into preventing and managing the disease. Strangles is the world's most commonly diagnosed infectious disease in horses. Although cases can go from mild to malicious, it is extremely contagious and can have devastating consequences for people passionate about enjoying life with their horse. Strangles Awareness Week is supported across the equestrian industry in the UK and across the world, and it calls for more openness and support for people and premises affected by the disease. With these podcasts, we aim to inspire open conversations about strangles and what helps in taking us closer to eradicating the disease. I am your host, Gilly Rydent. I am the campaign's officer for Red Wings Horse Sanctuary and coordinator of Strangles Awareness Week. And for our final day, we will be focusing on top level sport. David and Lisa have respectively worked as a show groom and vet at the highest level of equestrian sports. And they will be talking about changing attitudes towards biosecurity and how they keep their horses safe whilst traveling and competing globally. Please don't forget to subscribe, whether you are listening on YouTube or podcast player, to hear the other episodes in this series. And more importantly, share them with your yard, coach or vet. Let's spread the word and not the disease. We're very excited to welcome David Honey to the Strangles Awareness Week podcast. Welcome to our podcast, David. Thank you for having me. Would you like to say a few words about yourself to our audience, please? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm David Onet. I'm French. I'm a showgroom for around 15 years now. I work now for Scott Brush for five years. Uh, before that, I was working for Cameron Henley, an Irish rider. I was living in Germany for three years. Uh, I've been working a bit in Belgium as well, and I start my career obviously in France. Thank you very much. Um, what comes to your mind when you think of the word strangles? Uh, I kind of discovered that when I arrived to UK. Uh, first, because I, I didn't really know the meaning of it. We give it obviously another name in French. So the first thing for me was to understand what it meant in, in French. So um, I knew about this disease in France when I was young. I, I heard about it, but I didn't know much about it. And when I was working in France, I never came across any case. And then after a couple of years, I was in UK. A friend of mine had the strangle in in her stable. And then uh, then I realized that it was quite bad. People talking about it. And I I was not allowed to see her anymore because we tried to avoid contamination. So then I realized it was it was a big thing. Yeah. Um, so what are the main things you do to keep your horses safe from infectious diseases when you're out competing? I think the, the first thing I would say is to, um, I believe that if your horse is in good shape, is feeling good, is feeling strong, you have less chance to, to catch something bad, any kind of disease. So I would say the first thing to do is have your horses being well, not stress. Obviously, when you make them travel, they get tired, so don't overdrive, so they don't, you know, they, they stay in, in good form. Uh, so that would be the first thing, have your horse feeling good and strong. And for this, everybody does a bit different, but yeah, your horse ne- needs to be hydrated. That's really important. He needs to have enough rest. He needs to heat enough. Um, vaccination is also something important. Knowing your horse, knowing when your horse is a bit down, knowing knowing him well. You know, as a show groom, that's uh, really something you, you focus on, knowing each horse, because each horse is different. So some will lay down, for example, very often. So it's normal if they lay down. Another one, if he lay down, you say, ah, this one never lay down. So I should maybe take temperature a bit more often or check. So knowing your horse would be the first thing. And then the other thing is, checking the environment, uh, looking for any trace of infection or something not clean. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be the second point, yeah. Can you remember when strangles first came up in your career? 
Uh, well, probably when I was a kid, like riding ponies, I think I heard the, the, the words, but I, have, I had no idea at the time what it was, you know, and also I think we don't really have, I'm, I'll be a really experienced showroom and I've been all around the world and I know a lot of things and a lot of vets and so I still don't know enough about it, you know, so I would say that it's a, it's a lack or it's, a, you know, it's something that needs to get better. Uh, for me anyway, but maybe also in general. But yeah, I heard I heard about it when I was when I was a kid. Yeah. What do you think about Strangles' reputation, generally in the equine community and amongst international showgrooms? Yeah, when I had to when I came across like as I say a couple of years ago or maybe three years ago, a friend of mine had it and. I realized that it, I yeah I knew they had it in their stable and they put everything in a lockdown and they it cost them a lot of money to do the process correctly and obviously it was a big yard like normally going to shows and having some dealing and breeding and all that so the whole business stopped for them so I I understand then it was it was a big deal it was a big deal for them and. So how can the home and show team work together to protect horses in a yard? I'd say that communication is the key point, uh, communication between us. By us, by Scott, we're very lucky. We're a very good team that works very well together. Also, we are a small team, so it makes it easier. Also, our stable, there is not so many movements in and out. There is only Scott's horses. There is almost no teaching and almost nobody come from outside, so um, almost no dealing as well. We n- or never sell or rarely buy horses, so there is really few movements. So it's kind of a lot of easier for us to deal with with any virus or infection, or because we we kind of stay between us. So the only moment where the horses are exposed and when they are at the show. And, and that's it, you know, really. So it's, it's still really important because we're traveling a lot. And then between the, the home staff and the, the show staff, we just we just communicate and we let them know if how the horse was feeling in the last few days or, you know, we just talk about horses every day and make sure uh, an information is passing on to, you know, the, the person that's going to take care of the horse. Because, for example, I, I'm at the show for three or four days with the horse he's had whatever a bit of normally never happened but let's say he has a bit of fever or whatever you know if i bring him home and the next day i'm it's my day off i'm not here or i maybe uh, unload the truck reload and go straight away to the next show if i don't tell the staff at home that the horse has been a bit of fever or it's been a bit difficult with feed or you know, then it makes it more complicated and maybe they don't notice straight away and then the thing can get bad. So it's just talking about horses, mention everything that happened in the last few days and everybody is aware. Have you seen a change in attitude towards biosecurity and infectious diseases in the show jumping sport? I would say that weirdly this come from um, doping contamination. Uh, for show jumping, it's a really, really bad thing that's happening to us now. Uh, in my opinion, I think that the law, the rules have to change. Uh, but okay, I'm nobody to say that, but it's just my opinion. But we've, we had many, many cases in the last five years of doping contamination. So I think that made the, the people in show jumping really aware of, yeah, that your horse can touch something, can be exposed to something at the show, uh, at the stable, when you st- stop over on the road, you know, you have to stop when you go to Spain or Italy, you have to stop once or twice, you know, on the way. So I think that's really in the last five years, uh, get into people's head and sometimes too much. You know, I know that a lot of riders, they're, they're really scared and afraid that uh, this doping contamination could happen to them. To them and ruin their, ruin their career, really. You know, when, so I think a lot of the process we put in place and a lot of things we do f- for the horses to keep them safe comes from this this doping problem. And 
he works the same way with I mean I see in my in everything I do every day I think he works both for for infection for virus and also for doping like if you need to control what your horse is touching what is drinking what is eating you want to protect them from any disease and you also want to protect them the same way from contamination from doping contaminations and do you think the recent COVID-19 pandemic and the equine herpes virus outbreak in Spain has impacted this attitude towards biosecurity? Do you think it's improved it? It's built on the momentum that happened because of the scare of cross-contamination with doping? Well, it, in a way it did. I think people are more aware of it, but uh, the way I, I don't see really people acting differently. I think people are, are scared, really. I think people are, are aware. But when I see people working every day and the decisions that are taken by either show organizer or FBI or government, I think the problem, that's also the problem, is there's a lot of institution involved. You know, everybody has to take his responsibility and nobody wants to pay the bill or whatever. But I don't see, I don't see enough anyway. And I don't think it should be paranoid about it i think that's bad also uh i think you need everybody has to do his job and do his best but you you don't want to be over overdoing it you know i don't think uh being yeah exactly paranoid is the term you don't want to be too scared of things but i think people are more aware of all that right now but it's a bit like covid the way i see it is like people see everybody see a bit is I don't know how you say that in English. I know the expression in French, but everybody is just looking a bit his, his own garden, you know? Like you you would put things in place. You would say, oh, I refuse to do that, or I think this is really bad to do. But you would also do other things that uh, also as a risk, you know? So it's it's a little bit... And I think that's, that's what... It's really difficult for every person to know what's the right thing to do because you got so many information and that's that's the main thing to do it's give people information and then after that everybody decide on his own you know for everybody is responsible for himself the the fi is take his own his responsibility the the show organizer have to take their responsibility the rider the owners of the horses the vets on your job you do your best mm-hmm. You've just said that you don't think enough is being done. What would you like to see being done to improve biosecurity? In in your dream world, what would be the best thing we could put in place? Uh, I don't think there is some, I don't think there is a perfect system or, you know, I, but like, yeah, when you, when you travel, like, for example, when you do show in China or every time we go to America for, for the global, you know, we go to Shanghai or Miami or New York, the first two days we have to do a quarantine and when we have to do it it's actually a pain in the ass you know we really don't like it but actually by doing that we learn so much because the process they put in place at the time in china it's the chinese but in, in america it's the usda and they have really strong protocol and as i say it's really hard to do it when we get there but actually we learn from from that and I think in times of crisis, we should learn from them the way they do things. And I think it's, there is not really something perfect to do. It's, you draw a line, you know, between comfort for the horses, between still going to shows, still the business going, and the security of the horses, you know. And then the, the line is not fixed forever, you know. It moves, so it moves uh, according to person that has to to draw the line and it moves also according to the situation you know Mm -hmm. how can grooms manage the risk that comes with infectious diseases because you attend shows globally um, some of which are organized in very different ways so some shows have temporary installations whilst others are set up in long-term venues so how do you face these kind of different setups and the challenges that they bring? You just have to look around, look around you, have uh, be a bit focused. And so when you get to the show, you need to make sure that 
the stable you're gonna put your horse in is clear, is clean, is not dangerous as well. But this is just common sense. You don't rock up to the show and open the door and throw your horse in there and hope that it's gonna be fine. You know, you need to have a little check before, make sure everything is all right. So that's when you get to the show, but you should do the same also when you when you stop over on the road. So on the stopover, it's your own responsibility. You have to find good stabling for, for that. When you get to the show, you rely on the show organizer or the stable manager to provide a good stabling, you know. And then I must say we are very lucky with the, the show we do, like uh, always five star and good venues. And in general, it's always kind of perfect. There is little issue here and there or there, but in general, it's very good, I think. When you do lower level show, like national show or one or two star, I would say that's where you are. You have more chance to face problems. You know, in general, we are a bit spoiled. The show we do, the, normally the things are always clean and very well organized. So. Uh, thank you. Um, Strangles Awareness Week aims to encourage people to open up and have conversations about the disease and research how they could protect their horses better. Why do you think that it's important for people to get involved in this? No, but I think, I think it's, it's like anything in life. I think it's a bit stupid to say that, but information is power. You know? So if you, if you have information about something, you already handle the thing a lot better. So uh, not that you need to become an expert about strangle but as much as you know the better you know it the the more you're gonna be prepared if he ever come close to you or even in your stable or at least you're gonna have the the weapon to, f to face it you know you're gonna be able to to deal with it so i think yeah information communication is the is the key point yeah well thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today david it's been a real pleasure to have you on the podcast yeah Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we go from international show groom to international veterinarian, and I get the chance to speak to Dr. Lisa Leidbeck from Sweden. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Leidbeck. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes, I can do that. Uh, I'm a vet. I've uh, been a vet for 20 years now. And uh, I'm working mostly with sport horses. Uh, we also have some pleasure horses, but mostly uh, sport horses. And uh, I'm the team vet for the Swedish eventing team. I'm also an official FEI vet. So I travel around the world to different competitions, but uh, me and my husband runs a, a horse clinic and we do mostly lameness examinations, but a lot of pre purchase and uh, yeah, all kinds of things that you do with sport horses. So what comes to your mind when you think of the word strangles? Actually, what I think of first is when I was a little girl, 12 years old, and my horse was stabled in a riding school and they got strangles. It's, it's something that, uh, that I have uh, memories from way back, <laughs> that it was, well, it was not, not a nice experience when your uh, beloved pony <laughs> was very sick and uh, a lot of horses uh, were sick and uh, the riding school had to be shut down. And uh, uh, she survived and uh, no horses died or anything, but it was, uh, yeah, it, it brings you respect for the disease. Now in Sweden, it's not uh, it's not that common actually, uh, because uh, we have a lot of regulations here. Uh, this uh, it's not notifiable. You don't get away with uh, with strangles in in Sweden. How is strangles managed differently in Sweden compared to in the UK? Do you think there's things we could improve on? Uh, with this disease in the UK, I think it's it's really important that if you if you if we should try to get uh, less strangle cases, then 
we need to to be more open about it because it's in everybody's interest that horses can get really sick and die and uh, they can get problems that you can't see but it's in there in their body for life so it's it's good that we try not to spread it around yeah i think it's an advantage that it's notifiable in sweden because then you pick them up early and it's not spread around so that is a that's a good thing and when you have the government involved then you will also get some help and advice and <clears throat> how to take care of the horses and so that's a good thing and uh, i'm not sure how your national federation works concerning this but we have this we have to make a health declaration or ensure that that the horses has not met any other horses that had has been sick for the last three weeks and i think that helps as well because sometimes you're not sure if it's just uh one horse that uh, it's if it's just a cold or if it's something really serious and you have this rule if you have something that seems that could be contagious or yeah then you then you can't compete and then at least you don't spread it around what do you think about the reputation that strangles has generally in the equine community and amongst vets and competitors it's a little bit of an I don't know old disease. It's not like the like uh, horse in, equine influenza or the the herpes virus. That is, uh, it's it's something in Sweden. It's mostly riding schools that import horses from Ireland, England, Denmark, Holland, and uh, the horses that comes uh, from abroad that is uh, that brings the disease it's not spread around in sweden so it's it's not like you uh, i don't think it's a, a, at all the same situation as you have it because it seems like it's in your population it's it's uh, it's there all the time but it's not like that in sweden we have mm-hmm. like 70 stables a year uh, that will have an an outbreak but it's usually it stops there because if you come there as a vet, then you will even if you just have a suspicion, you will have to report that to the government. <laughs> so uh, so you don't uh, yeah you don't get away with it. Have you seen the attitude of top level competitors and national federations change towards biosecurity over the years? Oh yes, definitely. And I think after this year, for sure. Yeah. With with what has happened in Valencia and in Spain and yeah. So definitely and but it's 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 been um, high up on the list. Uh, I work for FEI and they are really it's it's a priority always uh, on those competitions, but I know that it's uh, for the organizer. It's it's uh, expensive to have a vet uh, there that does the uh, arrival inspection. Uh, sometimes people arrive over days, and if they should have a a vet there also during night time, it's 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 expensive. And sometimes I th- I'm I'm afraid that's that's. Um, yeah, that's where you they, you try to, to save some money there. And that's a, a really stupid thing to do. But uh, I think that that's, that's the problem. So uh, when I work at competitions, I try to ask the organizer if they, <clears throat> even if it's not so convenient for the competitors, but if you try to make them come at the special time, like we always have in championships that they arrive in, let's say, uh, yeah, you can arrive Tuesday from from 12 to 5. And then there is a vet there. You for sure know that the boxes are cleaned 
that the horses that was there previously is gone and it's yeah disinfected and everything because this drop in is is not good can you explain the role of the vet when the horses arrive before they're allowed on site uh, there is this arri- on FEI competitions there is this uh, arrival uh, inspection and then they check the vaccinations and they also <clears throat> look at the horses for nasal discharge and they should take the temperature of the horses. For some competitions, they want a, a, a form or something for, for the temperature every day and they check that. So that has been done and and uh, that's pretty much what they do. And that's, that's uh, you, you pick up a lot of things there. If they have some kind of symptoms of a infectious disease, they will be put in isolation. So they don't go into the to the boxes where all the other horses are. And if if there is only one horse in a in a trailer that is uh, is sick, or that seems to be sick, then all that horses needs they can't the other ones can't go in. So they will have to stay in quarantine as well. So the isolation boxes are also really important. And I think organizers are more aware of that part of the competition is is very important, that you have all those facilities. It's not only to have a a good uh, surface on your jumping uh, arena. It's also all those other things that is really important. On that point where you say that, the riders on the Swedish eventing team have their own personal vets and their own biosecurity protocols. So how do you work with them to ensure that the FEI's regulations and the country in which they're competing uh, laws are followed and respected? The FEI rules are the same if you, if you take an FEI competition. It's the same wherever you go. It should be the same. I think it's more a problem if you go to um, some places in England where you have those. It's it's uh, it's it's a lot of shows. You know, you you have competitions for a week, weeks, and it's a uh, it's ponies week, and then it's a uh, yeah, you know, uh, and usually you have shows perhaps for over weeks. And that is, I think, that's more a problem. But where we go to, like you say, Aachen and uh, and championships, there has not been any horses in those boxes, and it's been they, it's been properly um, disinfected, and uh, it's there is also this um, clip or something on the box, so you know that there has not been any horses there. You have to take scissors to <laughs> open it up. You can see that it, it's been disinfected. Of course, it happens sometimes that the organizer had a competition the week before and they are trying to save shavings. And uh, the, yeah, you, you need to be careful. And uh, yeah, it has happened. That, that was what we started with. Cleaning out boxes and the horses, yeah, take them out for for grass for a couple of hours before the boxes were clean. But that in, yeah. That doesn't happen very often. Um, Nowadays, the professional rider wears many hats. Uh, They're both competitors, trainers, horse traders, breeders, and so on. What is your advice when trying to balance the needs of these different roles and good biosecurity? We are organizers ourselves. We have an eventing competition here uh, at our farm. As an organizer, you always have to think of the costs. It's, yeah. But I also think that you have to think of your reputation and also what it, what it could, what could happen if horses get sick on your event, and what wh- what the consequences can be for the short term and also for long term. So, I think biosecurity is is really really important that first um, arrival examination i think for the organizer that's the most important one that you don't get sick horses 
in there because like two years ago yes um, when there was a competition close to the olympics and i was working there and i was there was a bit of a argue with the organizing uh, committee there because uh, i really wanted this arrival inspection to be perfect and you know the because if if horses were going to get sick there it there could have been problems with qualifications for the olympics and also horses perhaps in quarantine could not they could not go to to uh, the olympics and things that they have been training and planning and paying for for four years and and that competition yeah it, it's really important that that um and i said it's it's really bad publicity if if uh, if horses get sick at that venue and and they listened so um they 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 coped and no horses got sick but all almost always there is some horses arriving at a, a venue with with slight fever or because of um shipping fever and those things and uh, then you you have to be prepared to isolate those horses what would you like to see in the future for better management of strangles what you can do yourself is to make sure that you isolate horses that are new in the stable uh, that's an that's an, a really easy thing to do that you isolate it for three weeks you will will pick up some of them and you won't spread it around your whole yard and with and uh, all the horses so i'm i'm very much into quarantines and don't mix horses from different groups what i what i don't like then i will not be happy someone won't won't be happy with me in england but that's all those dogs running <laughs> around loose at competitions because they go from their own stable and uh, and they lick the horses' noses and then they run to the next stable and lick another one or they drink in the water uh, <laughs> buckets and they go around and yeah. Thank you. Uh, final question. Why do you think it's so important for people to get involved in the Strangles Awareness Week? I think it's it's good that you you start talking about it, uh, and it's a, education is always good. Strangles is a it's a bacteria, and in many ways it's easier to handle than a virus that spreads perhaps with the wind, and and you you can get really far if you understand how it how it spreads around and how other horses get infected and. You, you get really far with just washing your hands, changing clothes, and this isolation. It doesn't have to be big efforts sometimes. to, uh, But it's, it's education, of course, and, it's, and that's good if people get more aware about strangles, I think. Thank you very much, Dr. Lebeck. It's been a real pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much everyone who has tuned in to our Strangles Awareness Week podcast this week. It's been a pleasure to host these conversations and we hope they helped your understanding of strangles and how we can work together to prevent and manage it through support and transparency. We look forward to next year, but in the meantime, do stay in touch via our Facebook page or email campaigns at redwings.co.uk if you have any questions about strangles or the campaign. Let's spread the word and not the disease. <laughs>